Welcome to another Tuesday edition of Talk Sports here in the month of May. Rob Brooks along with Kevin Lehman. And Kevin, a, a beautiful Tuesday. I hope you got outside to enjoy it. Hope everybody uh, tuning in tonight did as well. And I've been few and far between here the last week or so. It hasn't been as nice as you would expect in the month of May. Well, it was gorgeous today. You know, it, it was a tough Mother's Day. Windy outside, a little bit of <laughs> rain, but... Beautiful day today. I mentioned earlier I was outside working on my dock, trying to get ready when the really good weather uh, hits us. And I know you get the clubs shined up. I try to get the jet ski ready to go. No doubt about it. The uh, the clubs have been shined up <laughs> many times so far this spring. And, you know, it's been uh, one thing uh, about this. It's been play, able to play golf. That's the one right. thing that people have been able to get outside and enjoy themselves for the most part. And I think a lot of the courses around here, which is great because that hasn't always been the case each and every year, have economically had uh, very good months of March, April, and so far May, and I, I think that'll probably continue. So I hope all the uh, the golf course uh, folks out there are enjoying this. Obviously, uh, it's a lot of extra work, making sure everything's uh, sanitized and uh, you can't touch the pins and going through all the, the safety factors, one person per cart most of the time. But it's still an opportunity for people to get out and get some, some fresh air, as you'll probably do on the uh, jet ski here in the next week or two. Well, I see you were able to get a haircut, Rob. My goal here when this pandemic ends <laughs> is to get to the barber and get that trim going, because this is tough, man. I, mean, you know, I had the beard there for a while, but now that the hair is getting long, it it's, uh, reminds me of my college days. Take, take us back a few years, right? Yeah, the gym yeah, that's right. and uh, the barber, kind of two key things going here in the next uh, week or two. Have a great show for you. Um, hopefully, uh, Kirk Ferentz, head football coach, of course, at the University of Iowa, will join us here in a few minutes. Tom Brands, after 7 o'clock, to talk uh, about Iowa wrestling. As we uh, talked about on the promo, Kevin, I think you go back and you, you never know what's going to happen with the basketball tournaments and wrestling but boy if there was ever a team that was poised to bring home a national championship and to have that opportunity and that had to be the Iowa wrestlers this year after just so dominating uh, winning the Big Ten regular season finishing undefeated at 13 and all of course winning the Big Ten championship and that was going to be a lot of fun and I think that the takeaway is would have been great for the sport of wrestling because the competition would have been outstanding. Well, no question. And Spencer Lee had a terrific year. They're not an ability to win a championship. Uh, that's unfortunate. We'll have a good time to visit with Coach Brands about how his team handled that, how he handled that as a coach, because as we've talked about, uncharted territories for all these coaches, how you deal with your student athletes during this time, how you keep them sharp, uh, what's the plan for the future. Uh, it's just a tough deal for not only the athletes, but also for the coaching staffs and how to – move forward with this pandemic yeah and of course everybody uh, struggling with this and i think pretty much now everybody knows somebody and maybe it's affected you personally somebody in your family but you know people that have uh, contracted this and it's a it's a serious deal and it's a situation where you know major league baseball trying to get something going uh, for right around the fourth of july the owners got together on a conference call yesterday and proposed somewhere around an 80-82 game season. Uh, playoff format, much different than the traditional playoffs. There may be as many as 14 teams playing in Major League ballparks with no fans, but would be on TV, would be on radio, but very limited media access. Went to the players' union today, the players' reps, and nothing has come out of it that I have seen. And I just don't know. I don't know how the, the players will feel about this. Obviously, you work through the money and see what comes out at the other end. Well, Rob, in my opinion, that the players got to sign off on uh, COVID-19 if they were to contract it. So there wouldn't be any liability to the owners or to Major League Baseball. And uh, that's going to be a big decision here by their by the union to see if they're going to do that because you not only you put yourself at risk as a player, but your family, if you're in any contact with your family members. So this is a big hurdle. It'll be interesting to see how this goes forward. Uh, and you know, the NFL put their schedule out. We're still, we're hearing about college football that maybe some conferences will start 
Some may not. So we can have a, a conversation with Coach Ferris about how that looks also. And how much time do you really need as a football program if you're going to start off on Labor Day weekend or the week before to have your team ready and healthy? Yeah, no doubt about that. And the fact that it makes it so much more difficult, I think, in college because you've got, uh, of course, the NCAA, but then you have all the different conferences that can weigh in mm -hmm. and really propose their own season, propose what they want to do. Then you look at the presidents. They're going to have a, um, a huge voice in it. Uh, politically, in each state, we'll have a big voice. So where you have one commissioner in the NBA or Major League Baseball, the NFL, you can come together and make one decision. That's the differentiation between the pros and college athletics is that, well, you could. You could see the SEC and the, the Pac-12, the Big Ten, not on the same page doing something differently. Yeah, no question. And wouldn't that be something? Then what you do with that playoff at the end if some conferences don't play a full schedule or don't play at all, uh, and then, you know, I've been reading about basketball, how it's difficult now for these teams to get their schedule completed. Most teams want to play close to home. The guarantee that you get to go play in the power five teams is becoming less. And that puts more of a bind on these mid majors and low majors because they need to fund their other programs with some of the guarantee money that they bring in on these types of games. So, you know, is plan A, plan B, plan C. Everybody's got contingency plans moving forward. You know, also, Rob, I do some work for basketball travelers who set up all the summer travel and summer tours for college basketball teams. Those are all on hold, and you'll wonder if these Thanksgiving tournaments in the tropical island uh, islands, is go those will be going forward either because uh, I've gone to the Paradise Jam for the last seven years, so I've got my fingers crossed to see if this thing is ready to go back in, when we get to November. Well, Coach Buter brought that up a couple of weeks ago where I uh, didn't know if they would go to Mexico to potentially uh, play in that. Well, let's take a break and uh, come back, and we'll be joined by Iowa head football coach Kirk Ferentz. Stay with us. Talk Sports on Mediacom MC22 is brought to you by McGrath Family of Dealerships, Iowa Lottery, the Tom Riley Law Firm, Clinger Paint and Interiors, and by Extreme, powered by Mediacom. reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared and you can be certain we'll keep your world connected.
Welcome back to Talk Sports. Rob Brooks, Kevin Lehman, and please be joined by Kirk Ferentz as um, we continue on Talk Sports. Uh, Coach, really appreciate you taking the time. And uh, boy, it's just been an unprecedented last couple of months. Uh, how has things changed as far as uh, communication with coaches, players? And boy, it, it's only been two months, I think, <laughs> but it, it yeah. seems like a lot longer than that, doesn't it? It really does. Our, our players are taking finals this week. So, you know, in normal circumstances, we would have had five weeks of spring ball. They would have been in class last couple of weeks, you know, getting ready for their finals and uh, out of town after this week. So, uh, but it is so different right now, certainly. Obviously, we haven't practiced, haven't met. And, um, you know, our team is kind of scattered pretty much all over the country right now. And uh, our big emphasis uh, continues to be just, you know, being safe. Uh, hopefully they have a good workout routine based on their limited uh, facilities, those types of things. Yeah, and then the biggest thing is just keeping uh, keeping things going academically, finishing the semester strong. Well, Coach, what's a day like for you during this pandemic? Uh, and meetings with players, coaching staff, go through what you're doing on a daily basis. Yeah, we meet as a staff a couple times a week. Uh, we meet on recruiting a couple times a week. Uh, I have an academic meeting, which is scheduled. and. Um, you know, then yeah, the rest of the time, it seems like you're on phone calls just uh, doing this or that. Uh, so it's amazing, uh, quite frankly, looking back, just how, how busy it has been um, despite the circumstances. And, you know, it's a little tougher when you uh, are trying to work individual players, uh, you know, reach out to them as opposed to having a chance to see them just on a routine basis in the building. So you're trying to make up for that. But it's, uh, yeah, it's just really different. It's maybe in some ways inefficient, but it is it does take some time. Chris Doyle's got to be busy, too, trying to uh, get uh, workouts to everybody all across the country with what they have access to. Yeah, that, that started, uh, you know, right at the onset of this thing. Uh, we left campus here on the 13th. We were going into spring break. So at least we had a week week's period where they wouldn't have been, you know, training or doing things with us anyway. So it kind of gave us some time to get organized. And uh, the first call of duty was uh, Chris and his assistants reached out to every player individually just to see what kind of resources they might might have available to them. Uh, for some guys, they, they have access to racks. They might have one in their basement or garage. Uh, maybe have a friend that has one, that type of thing. Other guys had nothing. So it might be a kettlebell or, you know, just body weight exercises. But they try to craft private programs for uh, each and every player individually based on what their uh, uh, capacities might be. And then they've stayed in touch weekly with them on an individual basis. Uh, as have the position coaches. So we're just trying to make sure we, we do have good communication with all of our players uh, throughout, the, throughout this period. Well, Coach, let me ask you this. What, in your opinion, what position suffers the most not having spring ball, not having the interaction? It would be your skilled guys, your linemen, or, or who would this have the most effect on? Yeah, I'd probably say the inside guys on both sides of the ball. The guys, uh, the interior players, beat up linemen, linebackers, uh, linemen on both sides, tight ends. Uh, probably the hardest thing to learn is, is really how to run block and play run blocks, those types of things. Yeah, and there's a lot of a lot of skill development there, a lot of uh, just, you know, it's just hard work and routine, basically. So, you know, that hurts. But also, you know, you at our football team, we've got a young quarterback uh, who's not experienced. So every snap, you know, I'd say that's true of all of our quarterbacks, every snap is important for them. Not, not that they're going to look great typically in spring, but they can take what they – um, take what they do in spring ball, the good things, but also maybe more importantly, the mistakes they make, and then really, you know, have that film and have that thought process available to them over the course of the summer. So our, our guys want, uh, would have had that after 15 days. They won't have that. So we're just going to have to catch up whenever we do get started again. But, you know, it, it impacts everybody, especially in a program like ours. And I said this uh, probably six weeks ago. I think a, a long delay uh, favors a team that has an experienced quarterback and has good genetics and so it sounds like ohio state right to you know right to the finish line right there. <laughs> with all due respect they do a great job coaching i'm not minimizing <laughs> right. it. got, got uh, a couple of guys though don't good players, yeah. <laughs> and a pretty good quarterback yeah coach as far as uh recruiting is concerned uh how how quickly did you have to just kind of change everything up there players can't come on campus uh, obviously nothing this summer looks like and uh, guys obviously transition very very nicely but boy that uh, couldn't have been easy you know one, one key uh 
with all this is, you know, how, how are we going to be able to adjust and adapt to whatever the circumstances may be? And recruiting, there are a couple of levels of things going on. First of all, the speed, the rapidity of the, the recruiting process has just changed so dramatically the last five years. Uh, what we used to do in May, we're doing in Jan January now, uh, going to high schools and primarily looking at underclassmen. So that, that, that part has really sped up the evaluation. Uh, the two things we're missing right now, opportunity for, for young players to come on campus during spring practice. Uh, not only were we not practicing, but we weren't hosting recruits and their families, having a chance for them to see the facility, meet some people and watch us work, that type of deal, meet our players. So we lost out on that. And it looks like we'll lose out on camps most likely. So that, that hurts our recruiting uh, process because we're always still looking to see how guys are growing. And it will factor in how we look at it next year as well uh, with the class of whatever it would be coming up here, 22, I guess. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a far-reaching thing. But the thing we did have available was more time to call, more time to connect with the uh, prospects that we were recruiting. Fortunately, we had a lot of guys on campus, not only during the season last year, uh, but a lot of the guys that we have committed right now were here for games. They were here either in January or uh, the end of February, early March, I guess it would have been for a junior day. So uh, at least the, the guys that we, the core of the guys are recruiting have been on campus a couple of times. They've got a, got a better feel for us maybe than somebody from, from far away. Well, Coach, congratulations. I know you have, uh, you've got some great commitments for that class of 2021, but with this pandemic, is there an advantage now if players are going to be staying close to home because of what you mentioned? They, they can't go to summer camp. So the fact that, uh, they won't be traveling so far across country. Do you have an advantage now of getting kids closer in the in the Iowa area and the surrounding states? Yeah, it'd be a bigger advantage if we were Penn State where you have all those people within five hours. But um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think we've been fortunate. We've had a lot of guys uh, not only from the, the four or five hour radius, but even further than that come for games. So they've been in Kinnick. And, and uh, I continue to be amazed how, how uh, players travel for prospect days. So. Uh, whether it's a young guy from Michigan or Ohio uh, coming over. So we, we've had pretty good success there. I think we're seeing more of that, not only with our program, but everybody's program. Um, but it certainly helps, you know, for, for a player to be here and, and get to experience things instead of like, you know, seeing a, taking virtual tours and things like that. You know, those are all helpful, but not, not uh, it's not the same as being here and actually meeting people and seeing them face to face. Kirk, is there just so many scenarios um, out there that, you just really can't even get your arms around what uh, potentially the summer might look like uh, and the fall might look like. Yeah, I think there are, and it's kind of like our whole country in general, um, you know, and, and part of it obviously it varies greatly, you know, based on the geography, uh, you know, where you're at. So obviously what's going on in the Northeast compared to the Midwest, very, very different. But yeah, there are a million scenarios going on right now. And, and I think the, the bottom line is really nobody knows so we are trying to, you know, have some educated guesses what could turn out and then, you know, what's that going to look like. And then once you start thinking about those scenarios, you have to start thinking about, so what's that going to entail? And just just as simple as, you know, to get a, a, a one of our players back in the building to, to train in our facility, which you could argue, at least we know, you know, it's got a better chance of being clean and we have a better chance of controlling the environment. Uh, but, what you know, what are the steps gonna, for those players to reenter? back into the building and then you know what are you going to do if there is somebody that tests positive all those types of things so yeah a lot of scenarios that are, are being considered right now and you know just an awful lot of people working really hard at that i know our athletic directors have been spending an awful lot of time basically in daily meetings as a conference uh covering a lot of different scenarios well kirk uh, uh five guys drafted you got another number of others will try to make it as free agents what's your best piece of advice that you give your players when they go into camp? Yeah, you know, it's kind of the same thing as we tell them when they come here. You know, really, uh, you know, you wouldn't be here if you weren't accomplished. So congratulations on that. And, and we're really proud of you for what you've done. Uh, but I also tell, you know, tell our guys when they get here that, you know, what you'll be judged on is what you do moving forward. So, you know, that, that's how we're looking at it. Everybody comes in even and everybody's got a fair chance. And and in the NFL, that's pretty true. Now, it's really hard for a first, second round guy to get cut. Uh, but the bottom line is, you know, people are going to respect you or not respect you based on what you do, not what you say, and not the resume that you bring bring with you from the past. So, uh, fortunately, most of our guys, you know, they've, they've been really good in our program. That's usually how they end up going to the NFL. 
and just encourage them to do the same thing. Stay focused on what is important. I think that's one of the biggest challenges for professionals is there's a lot more things to get distracted by than when they're in college. Now, college kids typically don't have money and they don't have time. So, you know, those are two things pro athletes have, even the lowest paid pro guy. So, you know, just staying off that track, staying focused on what's going to help them uh, be good professionals and, you know, li listen more than you talk. Same old things you learned from uh, from your folks growing up. Those things all still still hold true. Conversely, Coach, as a non-drafted free agent, you've uh, had several that have gone on to not only make it but uh, become uh, all pros. How hard is that scenario? And how much mental toughness does that take to make sure you persevere through um, what they would have to go through? It, it really does. And we've had plenty of guys have success. Ben Neiman was in the Super Bowl this year and pro probably played, you know, 35, 40 percent of the snaps for the Chiefs, both special teams. And he's on the sub defense. He went there as a free agent. And just the form that I just described, I know Ben did that, kept, kept a low profile, just worked hard and, and got noticed on the field for good things. And that that's the key. So. Uh, but the bottom bottom line is you're you're starting at the bottom. There's, there's no further down when you go than being a free agent. But but again, once you get on the field, uh, your reps may not be as plentiful at the early part of things. But at some point, you're going to get a chance. When you do, uh, you know, get in and get noticed. And James Morris uh, shared that with our team uh, a while back as an honorary captain. His story of being in New England, and you know, he was that close to being out of there. He finally got healthy, got on the field. And, and uh, nailed one of the uh, starting players on, in a drill that got the attention of a lot of people. And that's really how he started gaining traction. But yeah, don't, don't worry about your lot in life. Don't complain about it. Just go to work and, and try to do something positive. Well, on that note, talking about the NFL coach, we lost an icon in football and Don Shula last week. Uh, have you had any interaction when you were in the NFL or is with Don Shula? Yeah, you, you know, can tell us. Close, closest I got, Kevin, We uh, my first year in Cleveland, 1993, we actually played them. Uh, I remember for a lot of reasons, it was the week before our bye week, our first bye week, and uh, we lost the game. Dan Marino uh, blew his Achilles out, I believe the injury was. A guy named Scott Mitchell came off the bench, a left-hander from Utah, played very well, and then got a free agent contract, a very good contract in Detroit, pretty much as a result of that opportunity. Speaking of opportunity, and uh, the reason I remember the game is there was a blitz that we didn't pick up very well. Worked on it the entire next bye week and uh, thought I'd see it, you know, like, you know, probably 15 times in our first game after the bye. I never saw it again the rest of the season. So I don't know what people were doing, you know, why they didn't try to try to copy that. But, uh, but yeah, Coach Shul was on that sideline. Talk, talk about a legend uh, in all sports, not just pro football, but all sports. And, and a disciple of the Paul Brown tree, which is a pretty good tree. You know, think about you know, you think about uh, Welch, you know, uh, Bill Walsh out there in San Francisco. You think about Chuck Knoll, you know, guys that were associated with uh, Paul Brown. So, uh, but what, what, a, what a great person. Uh, everybody you ever talked to that worked with him or played for him says nothing but the best of, about him. You know, just high regard for, you know, what he meant to the football game and the, the kind of person he was. You never forget those negative plays, do you? Yeah, they stick with you. I guess it's <laughs> <laughs> this day, I, still, I do have a theory. You know, people are so fixated on their playbook. I, mean, I, I would have, I would run that blitz five times the first game. You know, but we never saw it. So I don't know. Coach, as far as uh, the NCAA and the, the stuff they've got going on with the, the likeness and the image, and I understand they're, they're potentially going to table the the one time transfer rule right now. Um, you know, they're still um, kind of going forward with uh, some of these things during this time. So they've got a lot on their plate too, don't they? They do. And, uh, you know, the transfer um, rule, first of all, is, I, you know, I don't know a coach that's in favor of it, but I think there are some legal issues with it. It's, it's a matter of time before it goes through. Uh, the one thing I do hope, and I know the Big Ten has taken this stance, uh, we're hoping that it's one time period, not one time as an under, uh, undergraduate and then also as a graduate. Right. Um, you know, that that's just, you know, it doesn't make sense at all. There's no common sense in that. So, Hopefully that'll get tabled and, and uh, that'll be the case. Um, you know, and there, there are two sides to every story. So there's some real good reasons uh, why this should go through, but there's also some danger that's going to come with it. Uh, you just worry about tampering, potential tampering. Not that that doesn't take place now, but I think it just opens the door maybe for a little bit more of that to be a possibility. And then name the name uh, likeness image stuff, 
Uh, a, I don't really understand it. I'm pretty sure I don't understand it. Uh, I am 100% sure. I have no idea how they're going to uh, be able to enforce it. So right. it's a really scary path we're walking down there. Yeah. As you as a staff, though, Coach, have you looked at how you might have to be involved in name, image, and likeness when you when you recruit and go forward in that direction? Or have you even addressed it yet? Uh, we have not really talked much time, uh, spent much time talking about it. Really haven't thought much about that. In one of our uh, conference calls with the, the Big Ten coaches, uh, one of the coaches brought it up, which this, this floored me. They talked about, you know, potentially a high school player having an agent <laughs> to help broker <laughs> his deal. And, yeah, you know, the reality is the, the sad part, at least from my perspective, uh, I'm not sure how many athletes we have at the university. It's in the hundreds. I know that. Uh, you know, how many, how many how many of those athletes are really going to benefit from this? You know, it's going to be a very small number, most likely. And then as you go around the country, those numbers may grow a little bit. So, um, you know, but it's it's one of those things that just, you know, we just keep moving forward with some things that are really sometimes hard to comprehend. Well, not only may need an agent, they'll need an accountant also to figure out their taxes, possibly. That won't be too many players, I don't think, you know, but uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, I guess it depends where you're at, too. Well, Coach, I know um, you fire on that TV every once in a while, and I was flipping around earlier today, and you'll remember this because um, your son was involved at Doc Dogs uh, over oh, 4th of July <laughs> several years ago, and, and I saw James. Yeah, participating in that. That's about all we can watch is a uh, classic TV right now. That kind of shows you where we're at right now. But I, I, uh, <laughs> I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Doc Dogs. Uh, you know, uh, it, it's funny. You know, and one of my observations was I, I think the uh, the spectators at Dog Dogs. This is my personal opinion. Uh, little league parents probably could learn from them. They're a lot more supportive, <laughs> a lot more positive uh, than some of the little league behavior I've seen in my time. So that, that's one thing. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll also remember last time I was up in Cedar Rapids, it's funny, uh, we, we bumped into Coach Staker and his wife. Uh, they were having a barbecue cook-off, I think, down a festival uh, in conjunction with the Doc Dogs. And uh, I remember seeing Coach Staker, so I just mentioned that or thought of it as you mentioned it. Yeah. Uh, we, we lost a, you know, just a, a tremendous person. Uh, they're a great family. And uh, you talk about, again, people that were respected, Don Shul and Coach Staker had that kind of impact, certainly with all, all the people he interfaced with. Yeah, you could tell by uh, former coaches, former players, uh, family members that uh, able to pay their respects. Well, Coach, really appreciate you taking some time, and uh, yeah. hopefully we'll we'll get back uh, at the university here soon. Hopefully, I'll be actually be a coach next time we talk. So we'll uh, <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Wish you guys uh, the best. still pretty right. busy. Thanks, appreciate it, Kirk. Thanks for thank you much, Coach. Thank you. Iowa football coach Kirk Ferentz joining us here on Talk Sports. I appreciate his time, and we'll take a break and be back with more Tom Brands coming up after 7 o'clock. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected.
Welcome back to Talk Sports. Rob Brooks and Kevin Lehman. I really appreciate uh, Coach Ferentz uh, joining us. Uh, Kevin, interesting stuff. And I think we've talked about it before, but this image and likeness right. is just going to be – and Kirk Ferentz has been around athletics at uh, every level for a long time. And I think he's exactly right. You, know, you just really have opened up um, a scenario where anything can happen when you're starting to talk about uh, agents getting into the high school ranks to try to uh, handle some of this stuff, even if that doesn't even happen, even the thought of that was, I think for uh, guys that have been around the game a long time, uh, certainly eye-opening for sure. Well, but it's coming, Rob, and you can't stop it. So it'd be interesting to see what the spinoffs of this are. And, you know, he, Kirk made a great uh, comment that somebody mentioned they may have agents as high school players trying to work the best deal for their name, image, and likeness. So uh, this is something uh, we won't, we haven't seen in the past, but it's coming down the train, the tracks, and we can't stop this train. Be interesting to see where we're at five years from now with name, name, image, and likeness. But I think that's where Iowa football does such a, a good job in finding players that fit what they want to do and fit the system and it works and you know maybe that's um, a scenario where if you get somebody that's really into that side of it maybe doesn't love the game as as much as, uh, as certain programs would like them to then that's a scenario where maybe they end up going somewhere else well and you know kirk made a great comment about the program is when i asked him about what advice for his guys going in the nfl training camps is you know you know Basically, keep your head down and listen and soak in all you can, and, and you're going to be judged on your performance. Because I've always said this about this name, image, and like this. What if you've got a booster that gives X amount of dollars for this player, and he's hurt right away, or else he doesn't perform up to expectations? We've seen a number of guys that came in with high, uh, you know, four stars, whatever, that either get beat out or just don't perform. So what happens in those situations? There's so many things that came up, come about with this name, image, and likeness that we haven't even comprehended. Right. And what it'll look like um, next year versus what it might look like four or five years from now. It could be yeah, almost like you know, two different rules because there's always unintended circumstances that uh, will take place. And somebody at the NCAA will sit back and say, well, hey, geez, I didn't think this would happen or this isn't what the rule's meant to be. But when you open something up like that, there's so many different scenarios that will take place. We'll, we'll take a break and uh, hopefully uh, join up with Iowa wrestling coach Tom Brands when we come back or talk sports at MC22. I'm your way next. Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected.
Welcome back to Talk Sports. Rob Brooks and Kevin Lehman. Appreciate uh, everybody tuning in tonight. Uh, we're going to roll this all the way through at least the end of the month, Kevin. We've, we've got enough to talk about. And, uh, of course, uh, yes. we'll go up and, and pick up some more guests and uh, keep it rolling. I think um, it's been uh, been fun here in the month of May to, to talk sports. And maybe one of these days we'll, we'll get back out on the field and the courts. Well, and each week uh, in between our shows, you hear more about Major League Baseball, NFL, uh, NBA, what, what they're trying to do to plan ahead. And, you know, I, I think the NBA is going to have to suspend their – and just call it a season, Rob. I know they're trying I to get the so. playoffs in. I don't think they can do it. And, you know, Charles Barkley came out and said they need to just cut it and move on, and uh, I think that's what we're going to see. Yeah, I agree with you because you look at it, how long do you go, and then all of a sudden it's going to be training camp. Uh, the NHL have to do the same thing. Uh, basically, the AAA uh, hockey league out there canceled. We won't see minor league baseball this summer, in my opinion. Right. And maybe major league baseball. I, I just I don't know. I two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I was a lot more optimistic that there'd be some baseball, and I'm hopeful. But you kind of feel like. Come July 4th, that's, right. that's got to be kind of the drop dead date because once you get past that, then all of a sudden you're getting into next season and you, you hate to give up a season, but I bet strike years and lockouts before and you know maybe it's better to be on the safe side. Yeah, we'll see what happens also if they don't play Major League Baseball. What happens to salaries and those types of things? Because, uh, you know, there's no income, whether it's TV revenue or at the ballpark revenue. And another thing that uh, we mentioned with Kirk Ferentz, uh, we tell our listeners that that one-time transfer rule in college athletics was going to be up for a vote May 20th. That's been tabled till this uh, till next winter. So you're going to see players that may have to sit out unless the NCAA decides to grant waivers across the board. And yeah. we know they're getting more lenient with waivers, but uh, that rule itself. And I thought Coach Ferris made a great comment that coaches are hoping that this just is a one-time transfer. You can't transfer again as a graduate transfer because there's that loopholes in there also. So we'll see how that – that will be tabled for a while. So those players that are transferring to other schools that are undergrads, they're going to have to sit this next year unless they are granted a waiver. Yeah, that'll be the interesting thing if they will table it till next uh, January is how many waivers uh, will they grant? Right. Obviously, they'll, they'll do plenty, but is it just going to be everybody and then basically it is a one-time transfer or will they just continue, which nobody can figure out the process, uh, go through the process to try to get a waiver because I, I paid some attention to this in football and basketball both and i can't figure it out where one player gets it and the other player doesn't seem like it's uh, kind of on uh, the same playing field uh, in the conference out of the conference hard to at least uh, from the outside looking in hard to uh, get your arms around it well i think that's why rob we saw this proposal to grant a one-time uh waiver one-time transfer rule because no one understood who was getting it and why, why were some being denied and some weren't. And, and, and on the talk about waivers on the good news front, Iowa basketball got word today that uh, Jordan Bohannon has granted his extra year for the medical hardship along with Jack Nungy. So that's good for the Iowa basketball team. Patrick McCaffrey is still waiting to hear on his medical redshirt waiver. So uh, good news for Iowa basketball. They're going to add those two players to the to already – if Garza stays to a team that's really going to be loaded next year. Yeah. And then I think that was just a, a affirmation right. I was going to uh, take place, but you always like to see the official word. And I am yes. I'm sure that Patrick uh, will, will be right there too and be able to get it. Cause he played in less games than the other two. Right. Yep. No question. So you know, a lot of things uh, happening here in college sports, as long as waivers, name, image, likeness, all these things spinning forward. And, you know, also that rule that I know Coach talked to, touched upon was the grad transfer rule. There's one that's been a great idea to start out with, Rob, but right. it was abused throughout athletics uh, for kids to transfer. Because originally you're supposed to be able to transfer to work on a master's degree if the school you're at didn't have that program. 
and that just became a facade. So players were getting the grad transfer uh, all across the board, and the percentage of people actually getting their master's degree was very low. Yeah, that's exactly right. And um, I remember Fran McCaffrey talking about that over the winter, where you know, if you do a grad transfer someplace, they should have a program that uh, fits what yeah. you want to do. And um, obviously, you're just doing it to play basketball or football, and you get that. But you're right. That's one of those unintended consequences that came up that you, know, you just uh, can't get your arms around when you write the rule. But as time goes on, there's always uh, loopholes and, and ways around it. And uh, many players have been able to find that. And you know, good, good for them to utilize it because, you know, like a Bakari Evelyn. And yes. if, you're, if you graduate uh, from your undergraduate institution and, hey, you'd like to play one more year of, of college football or basketball, you know what, have at it. But um, you have to pay attention to that, obviously, as a coach. But how many times do you really lose a prominent player uh, to your team to move on? But there are scenarios where you mid-major to uh, a major college program. Rob, I listened to a podcast that had Bob Huggins on. It was uh, Dan Dawkins. I listen to his podcast all the time. And Bob Huggins said every player that's left his program at West Virginia, whether it's a grad transfer or transferred as an undergrad, their stats were less than what they had at West Virginia. Across the board, every player, uh, and he was dead against this one-time transfer waiver that they're talking about passing. And because he was a red shirt when he was an athlete, uh, he started, I think he started Ohio State and transferred to West Virginia, ended up graduating there. He said that was the best thing that happened to him. And you probably know that too, Rob, from experience. That year that you're able to red shirt and mature, and I coached at Northern Iowa, we had a number of players do it. Cam Johnson, I see Rapid Jefferson was a kid who, who played his first year, then elected to red shirt. They gained so much from that year sitting out because they knew what they needed to do as far as in the weight room, nutrition, to improve their game. And their fifth year, they were so much better players than they were going to be that year that they sat out. So it, it's, uh, it's not a bad thing to have to sit out when you transfer. Yeah, no doubt about it. And uh, it can be tough mentally going forward and not being able to play because a lot of players, that's the first time since they were five or six years old that you're yeah. not putting a uniform on and going out to compete. But I think as you look back, uh, most players say, hey, that was uh, the right thing to do, even though maybe at the time didn't want to do it. And then on the other side, I've talked to several football players that would have loved to have red shirted, but due to injuries and maybe a little bit weaker at certain positions got thrown into the mix a little sooner than um, physically they were probably ready for. So when you finish off that year, those four years go quickly, look back and say, boy, I could be looking forward to my senior year, which I could have really used. Well, you know, and there's such a low percentage that go on to play professional sports. Would you rather have five years of college? It's a great time in right. your life what's, when what's you look back upon it. And, you know, speaking about we're seeing more and more uh, players opt to go in the NBA into that uh, special program that they come right out of high school and go into the G League. And I'm like, man, they're only going to play like 12 games. Wouldn't you rather be on a college campus? Because they're going to be playing for a blue blood program, whether it's Duke, Kentucky, Kansas, North Carolina. That's a great experience that they're going to miss out on. Yeah, no doubt about that. Well, let's take our final break. And we'll be back and wrap up the last 10 minutes or so of Talk Sports. Stay with us. Talk Sports on Mediacom MC22 is brought to you by McGrath Family of Dealerships, Iowa Lottery, the Tom Riley Law Firm, Klinger Paint and Interiors, and by Extreme. Powered by Mediacom. You're the engine that makes all things go, and you're always in disguise, my hero. I see your light in the dark. 
smile in my face when we all know it's hard there's no way to ever pay you back bless your heart no i love you for that honest and selfless i don't know if this helps it but good job you're doing a good job a good job good job you're doing a good job don't get too down the world needs you now know that you matter Today, more than ever, you need fast, reliable internet. At Mediacom, we want you to know you can count on us. Our fiber-powered 100% gigabit technology network was built for the future. We have enormous capacity and power and 99.99% .99 network reliability. So even though these are uncertain times, we're prepared. And you can be certain we'll keep your world connected. Welcome back to Talk Sports. Uh, Tom Brands uh, having some technical difficulty with his Zoom, so we hope that he'll be able to call in here. If um, not, we'll try to catch him uh, next week, and maybe even if we do get him for a few minutes, that um, we'll still be able to uh, catch up with him here in the next uh, week or two, because as we talked about at the top of the show, Kevin, boy, if there's one thing from a sports standpoint from the spring just kind of hanging out there, well, I would have really loved to see that. National Wrestling Tournament. Oh, no question. And what an opportunity Iowa Wrestling had to win a national championship uh, with a number of wrestlers. They qualified in the national tournament. Uh, a great team. And you know, we talk about people having the rug pulled off underneath them in what's happened with this COVID-19. There's one program that – what? how hard would that have been as a coach to tell your wrestlers that you're no longer going to be able to compete for a national championship – because of the pandemic, uh, tough situation. Be interesting to hear Coach Brands talk about how he's handled that, how his players, his wrestlers have gone forward here to stay in shape. You know, we talked to Kirk Ferentz about what they have available to work out with. You know, some had just kettlebells, some guys are doing push-ups, sit-ups uh, to keep your edge going forward. So you have to be somewhat innovative during this COVID-19 as far as an athlete to stay in shape and be able to uh, – you come back ready to go. You know, it's interesting, too. You think about the programs that, that don't have uh, the, the training table all summer, the, uh, the big uh, football facilities or, or basketball uh, workout facilities that, you know, kind of play with a chip on their shoulder a lot of times. You wonder if being driven away from campus, yeah. working out on your own, Maybe that helps that type of program along a little bit. Well, Rob, you're going to find out with your players, and I was going to address this with Coach Parents, is because some guys you know will take care of business. Other guys you're going to be in contact with daily to get a little, give them a little push. Not only has that happened as far as their nutrition, their strength training, but also in academics, you kind of know which guys can take care of business themselves, which ones need a little more support and that you got to stay more in touch with. And that's one of the jobs of the coach to know your players and who needs that and who doesn't. Tom, is that you? Yeah. <laughs> coach. <laughs> well, I appreciate you, you calling in here. And um, everybody, of course, um, used to all the, the Zoom stuff here, getting, uh, getting used to that. But uh, the phone still works. And, you know, Tom, one thing I want to start off with, uh, you had 17 wrestlers, uh, academic all Big Ten, a record for the program. That came out this week. It is finals week at the University of Iowa. 
Uh, you had 13 last year, which is a, a record. So, you know, yeah. you lose track sometimes that uh, these guys got to go to school too. But uh, your guys are obviously getting it done in the classroom as well. Yeah, a lot of guys lead the charge there too. Um, it, you know, obviously there's a lot of numbers there, but uh, lead the charge and just doing it on your own are two different things. And there's pride in the academic arena now and there's friendly competition and that always helps. Well, coach, take it, take us back uh, eight weeks. Uh, we've been into this and it seems like um, a lot longer and um, obviously there's bigger issues. We all know that, but from a uh, sports standpoint, uh, how was it uh, trying to communicate with uh, your wrestlers that had done so much up to the point before the national tournament and uh, let them know that it wasn't going to happen. That uh, had to be a tough conversation, even for a guy like you that is really good at looking forward. Well, yeah, that's what you do. You move forward and you talk about it. Um, we had our guys centered. We felt like pretty quickly, uh, this is what we talk about. This is life. This is athletics. This is jobs and families. You know, sometimes you get blindsided, and the best way to handle it is to take the next step the problem with this one was we didn't know what the next steps were so that made it a little bit tougher but you know in the end it's about doing what you can do every day to get yourself better and that it is really as simple as that well coach Kevin Lehman here what's your daily routine now look like as the head wrestling coach give us an idea what you go through as far as contact with your wrestlers your staff and so forth through this uh, pandemic and social distancing well, right now we're in finals, so that's first and foremost. Our guys are getting ready to take their last finals. We're halfway through the week tomorrow, and, you know, we're looking to finish strong academically. That's number one right now. Uh, there's no competition on the, of, on the calendar. So, you know, we're just waiting to see when we can get back into the arena uh, and start, you know, you know, conditioning and strength training together. They're doing that on their own, of course. Um, but then the next step would be to get on the mat. And, you know, what that's going to look like, it's going to be smaller groups, of course. It's going to be wise and prudent and smart. And, you know, we're going to have to brainstorm to figure that out and lay that out so everybody's comfortable going that direction. And that'll get us through, hopefully, to August. And I don't know when it's going to open up, but... Um, I know our guys are ready to go when, when it's ready to go. We, uh, we're, at a, we're at a time where, uh, you know, I always say we have to play football, but, you know, we have to have these fall sports get off the ground. And, um, and then I think wrestling and the winter sports will follow. So, again, you know, our, the guy that butters our bread, so to speak, Kirk Ferentz, he's got to lead the charge on this baby too. So, um, we're looking forward to a good football season. How's that for optimism? Yeah, well, it's a, we just had him on, and uh, he wanted to make sure that we told you hello. And um, you're exactly right. That's uh, the key thing, Coach. But um, the health of wrestling, too. Uh, there was just it's such a great season in the Big Ten. You led the charge. Those home crowds, you can, you can still hear them in the, the back of your mind at Carver Hawkeye Arena. Uh, just how about the, the health of the sport, uh, going forward. It seemed like it was a, a, a terrific year in the Big Ten Conference, especially last year. Yeah, the Big Ten is definitely leading the country. Um, there's other programs out there. Oklahoma State's still re very, very strong and relevant. Uh, the Big 12, and then you have, you know, the ACC's making a move. And, you know, it, it's strong in pockets, and it's strong uh, regionally in the Big Ten. Uh, the biggest thing with wrestling right now is – uh, these programs that are smaller budget with this, you know, so-called pandemic crisis, and we can't let it turn into a crisis for wrestling. And uh, that's, that's, you know, definitely on our focus uh, as a coaches group and making sure that we're strong. Uh, but sometimes it's, it's going to be one of these things where, you know, you got to be stronger than your brethren meaning there's going to be athletic programs that are going to be picking sports on which ones are going to survive this and which aren't. And that's what wrestling has been doing for the last three decades. 
uh, with our coaches group and making sure that we're strong and we've been able to keep our head above water and actually make some progress. Uh, but this is going to be definitely a test for us, for sure. Hey, Coach, tell us about Spencer Lee, uh, you know, Hodge Trophy winner, James Sullivan Award winner. What has made this young man so special? Well, I mean, I talk demeanor to his teammates when I'm using um, guys as examples. You can, you can be very ferocious as a competitor. You can still be humble and you can still have the right approach. And that's how I would describe Spencer Lee. He's very ferocious on the mat. Uh, make no mistake about it. He is given inch uh, to his opponents, but at the same time, um, he's humble and he did very well. And Sullivan Award, he represents he represents that well because of the esteem and prestige. Um, you know, he just he carries himself very well. He was. Uh, definitely raised right, has, you know, gravitated to professionalism. He's going to be a great administrator or a coach. No uh, doubt about that. Well, Coach, appreciate you taking the time. And maybe we'll pick up um, in the next uh, week or two. Tom Brands on Talk Sports. Appreciate his time. We'll be back next week. You join us next Tuesday at 630.